So the room now is open for discussion and questions. May I start with Dr. Sultana? Uh, it was a beautiful presentation about the correlation of the rapid TRI and the C-DI and the S-DI. But as a rheumatologist, do you think that you can depend on the rapid TRI per se, knowing that the fibromyalgia and the depression may affect the score? Would that be uh, something that you would use to change management of the patient? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the uh, thing is, the rapid score has been evaluated in fibromyalgia patients as well. The questions that are involved mainly the articular, the function part of it, anxiety as well as uh, depression is part of the questions that is involved. So it's a given general stat uh, idea of the status of the patient. So fibromyalgia, in fact, can affect the uh, the score as as you said. Uh, Dr. Mayada, this one is for you. Uh, it was beautiful that you shed light on the reactivation of TB with rituximab. Um, do you think that we should address that as national guidelines for screening, knowing that the international guidelines did not take into account uh, areas where the disease is endemic? What's your input? Okay, thank you also for your question. Actually, yes, um, uh, if we look to the ACR guideline, which has been um, um, released in 2009 and updated 2012 and into the, the late to, to 2015, they add uh, JAK inhibitors as a part of that we need to, to uh, um, as a part of uh, biologics and we need to uh, screen before. But yes, we have a conflicting data regarding Rituximab uh, because even uh, as we know that Rituximab may be, uh, be a selective for uh, some patients who have high risk for TB. But I think that uh, still we, more researchers have to, to, to go uh, to, to be on. Uh, um, there's some data uh, which, as I mentioned, one of the uh, big research has been done before, showed uh, also that uh, there is some uh, conflict data about that. Um, uh, importantly, that beta B lymphocyte play a role, or it's found in the outer line of the granuloma. So we don't know actually, is it, uh, Still, in our research, it's been found that two of our patients was on rituximab. Is it uh, have a direct impact on that or no? I think that it should be considered later on in uh, researches, yes. And one other question, yeah, the steroid dose that you discussed during the study, was that the cumulative dose or the current dose that the patient received? Uh, no, actually, it was uh, around the uh, cumulative dose of uh, patients. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Omer? Just a quick comment. You said marriage was associated with more nausea with methotrexate? Yes. Any explanation for that? I think uh, husbands make uh, uh, their wives uh, nauseated and fatigued, and uh, uh, having methotrexate on top of that might be the problem. Actually, uh, when you do this kind of analysis, you find uh, some noise that might not be clinically important for you um, as a researcher or as a clinician applying the data. Now, if you see the same observation in multiple studies, it might be confounded. So, for example, as in our study, we have seen that the patient global assessment, the pain score are high. So maybe being intolerant to methotrexate is related to being stressed in life. So a mother of six uh, working uh, might be uh, the source of stress and taking a drug like methotrexate that makes her, her fall and uh, her friends telling her that you're taking chemotherapy will all uh, be blended into this uh, kind of uh, 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 thinking of the patient because um, if you allow me, in the questionnaire, uh, some questions are anticipatory. So the patient feels that he's nauseated, tired before taking the dose. So this is the anticipatory uh, symptoms. So it is not, it's not related to taking the methotrexate and having nausea and vomiting or, or having a, a epigastric pain. So I think that uh, maybe this study group of patients, uh, the psychological component has been the predominant. So we need to really um, uh, apply the study on a larger uh, cohort for and uh, having actually more representation from different uh, uh, patient subgroups, especially in Saudis. 
we have to be very careful. Females are intolerant to many other medications. It's not only methotrexate. If you look at antihypertensive, they don't tolerate antihypertensive uh, as well. So but probably we need to interpret this finding with caution. Totally agree. We have a question from Professor Mayouf. Go ahead. I have two questions, one for Dr. Mohammed, one for Dr. Rahim. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, probably you mentioned that, but uh, I don't get it. Did you look in the adherence or the patient adherence to folic acid? And what was the dose of methotrexate? Did you look in that? I'm sure you did. And the route of administration? Was there any uh, So the question is about the route of administration of methotrexate and the dosing of folic acid. So basically, uh, in, in our study, uh, all patients were having uh, the similar dosing of folic acid, which is five milligram weekly, uh, at the day of the methotrexate or one day after. It doesn't really matter. So we did not see any difference in view of folic acid uh, administration. And also, we did not see any difference between the route of, 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 of administration. And, uh, our data are consistent with the two or three other studies that were uh, uh, using methotrexate intolerance score as a primary outcome in adults, where the route of administration did not make a difference. In some studies, actually I think one of the pediatric studies have shown that the uh, oral uh, route ha was associated with more intolerance. So uh, again, you have to take patients uh, one by one. So when people ask me, do you see more intolerance with oral or sub-Q? Um, uh, it's really difficult to answer this question because it's not the root, uh, because we have found that the behavior component is actually the major player. Dr. Ibrahim, uh, well, um, regarding you said that the steroid probably has a role in the maybe comorbidities. Again, did you look in the cumulative dose? And what about the biologic? The, the, the second question, did you look for the cause of aneurysm? Was it, did it make any difference in the outcome? The cause of aneurysm? Yeah, in yeah. those patients. So this is a wonderful question. So the question is uh, whether we looked at uh, uh, doses of uh, steroid and uh, cumulative versus yes or no. And uh, to make the story short, yes, we did look at the steroid on both, whether the dose or the uh, categorization, yes or no. And by all, there is a lot of literature that address why you may see a signal with one rather than another. Uh, if we, if you assume, when we take a medication, this assumes that uh, there is an, something called time varying nature of the medication, i.e. the impact of the medication is not static. It change over time. When you take the cumulative dose, that account for this cha time changes to some extent. But when you say yes or no, it assumes that the impact is one impact, even if you take five milligram once in your lifetime. So the short answer, we did look at both. I didn't show the data, but it seems that the steroid has an impact on the vascular intervention, irrespective of the population itself. So even when you look at uh, patients who are taking steroid for a period of time but not having rheumatoid arthritis, we see the consistent impact. Now, this is not published yet. So, the, so, so that ad addresses the point that do we think that there is a causality? Do we think that steroid is contributing? Now, this is not the first time. There was another uh, study uh, published uh, in, in JAMA, um, uh, uh, in JAMA surgery that actually looked at the comorbidities and risk factors for vascular intervention, and it seems that steroid uh, plays a major role on the comorbidity, uh, on the outcomes. Biologically speaking, steroid has an impact on thinning tissues, but also has an impact on the, uh, on the uh, thrombus formation. And we know that the uh, outcomes, uh, the bad outcomes that we are referring to include NACE, so major adverse cardiovascular events, including either heart attack or stroke. So that could be a contribution factor. The second contribution factor is obviously the risk of infection, and that may lead to uh, a subsequent risk in the ICU. Definitely we need more data, more studies to look at the 
the pathway through which steroids ca has a, a major uh, negative impact on our uh, population. But th this is the prelim uh, answer. If hopefully I, ca I answered some of your questions. Time for one more a a question. Go ahead. My question is for uh, Dr. Lamir. Uh, so, um, did you notice, Dr. Mohammed, uh, any statistical difference between the uh, dose of MTX, for example, the patient who has been on small dose, like the patient who, ha who has been on a large dose, or there is no indifference? Okay, so uh, maybe you, the, the data were not shown uh, in the slides, but um, most of our patients um, are receiving a dose equivalent to 12.5 milligram or more. So um, uh, we, did, we did not have an adequate number of patients to evaluate uh, small dose versus high dose of methotrexate. But this would be an interesting point to look at if we have a larger sample size and, and uh, um, uh, differences in the uh, uh, population we're studying. Conclude our session and thank you again for all our speakers. So as we are trying to keep up uh, with the uh, program, uh, we will go for a very short 10-minute uh, uh, breaks. Uh, following that, we will uh, start with our first satellite symposium by AVV. Uh, we're uh, returning back, uh, inshallah, at uh, 10.50. Thank you so much. 10.45, uh, sorry. <laughs>